my name is Stephanie. I'm an alcoholic. Um, my home group is the Basics Group in Durham, North Carolina. We meet on Monday nights at 7 o'clock um, over at the Triangle Presbyterian Church off of 54. And it really is a great home group. Um, you know, I feel at home there. There are a lot of women there who are uh, just an amazing support group there. And um, I have a sponsor. She's here tonight. She has a sponsor, I believe, in sponsorship. And, um, and after that, I think I'm good. <laughs> um, I did bring cookies, by the way, on the back table. So if you don't enjoy this, please enjoy the cookies. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, uh, this, this program's a miracle. I'll just start off what it was like you know, what happened and uh, how it's like now. Um, I was born June 21st, 1968, so I'm an old woman in Durham, North Carolina. <laughs> and um, I have, uh, so my family, um, my dad is from Sydney, Nebraska, very, very small town, almost in Colorado. He was always a big, gentle giant, 6'4". And my mom was a 5'2", fiery little French woman. So they were total opposites in everything, but they will be married uh, 58 years this year. Yeah, so I mean, they, um, they, they've been married 58 years. We lived in the same house for 45 years. My dad was 40 years. Of, I mean, they, they, everything they did, they just, you know, it, it just followed what society believed to be the right thing. And then there was me. And you know, and and from the get-go, um, my father was um, he was chief of his department at Duke. We were always we were never spoiled. Uh, we we were always taught, you know, the value of money, but we never needed for anything. Like I never worried about anything as a child like that, but yet I always worried. I was always full of fear. Um, I was always very loved, but um, but just full of fear for no reason, really. And then uh, when I was the third child of four, um, and when I was eight, um, my sister was killed in a car accident. And it just, it changed the life. Um, everything that I knew at the house kind of just it was chaotic. Um, there was blaming involved with what happened. It was, it was a car accident. It was a teenage car accident. Um, I was told at that time, you know, well now, like a lot of pressure was on, me, was on me because I was the only daughter left and everything. I have two brothers, an older and a younger. And, uh, and so that fear entered that next level, you know. Um, also, what happened during that time, like I didn't really understand everything going on, but when uh, Jennifer was being placed in the ground, I, I just started crying, like my heart broke. I realized that was the last time um, I would ever see Jennifer, and, uh, and just such pain. And I remember saying to myself at eight years old, I never want to feel that again. I can't. I just, you know. And so I was able to just block that pain out, and, and I wouldn't be able to tap into it. So, you know, I would, we would, every April 7th, which was the anniversary of her death, we would go to church, and everybody would be crying, and I couldn't even cry at this time, because I had really just shoved that into a place where I couldn't be hurt by it anymore, which is what we do. We, we avoid pain, we avoid feeling, uh, at whatever cost. Um, I was still, though, full of fear. Um, I would school just every year. It was just like, oh my God, I just wanted to die. You know, I would, I just, I couldn't stand it. The beginning of the year, just, I just wanted to hide. I would, I would sit there and imagine that I really wasn't there. I wasn't alive, like, like see myself from a third person. I just, I mean, you know, and and it didn't get better. I mean, by high, by junior high, you know, 
I had resentments. I had a little Dorothy Hamill haircut. My dad had me playing the cello. These weren't like popular items, you know. <laughs> it was not. It was not going. I was scared what everybody thought. I was scared of everybody. I just, you know, and. Um, and every other summer we spent in France, and I loved going to France. I mean, I loved, uh, you know, and after a while they had me drinking because, yeah, I was 14. What was the, why wasn't I drinking red wine? So I was drinking red wine, and, you know. Um, so by 15, I was really ready for a drink. I mean, I, I was full, and... My parents had a place at Holden Beach, and they would go there for the weekend, and I had gotten a job at Chick-fil-A, and this job at Chick-fil-A was very, very important, obviously, and I needed to stay home to work my job at Chick-fil-A, and they needed to just go on to the beach and let me take care of myself for the weekend, and... I, like, I planned it. I knew I was going to get drunk. I didn't know why I wanted to get drunk. I didn't know what it was going to do, but I knew I wanted to get drunk. And as soon as I got drunk, I mean, that hit, I felt relief. I, all of a sudden, what, that fear that was just crushing, what, you know, went away. All of a sudden, I felt like I could associate with people. I could talk with people. I was okay. And I can still remember to this day sitting at the corner of that house that we were in for 45 years, and it was 6 o'clock in the morning. I had you know, been up all night drinking, and drink um, Schaefer beer. Warm, I was drinking warm Schaefer beer, and I had taken the tabs off the can, a classy drinker at that, and was just flicking them at the house like, this is what I had been waiting for. And it was. And I sh I chased that feeling, that six o'clock in the morning feeling, for a long, long time, you know, just to be in that comfort zone. And, um, and so, you know, high school, um, it, it would be this battle with my parents. It would be like, my, my dad is from Nebraska, like I said, he's salt of the earth. And, and if you lie to them, they can't trust you anymore. And that was a huge thing. With my, he didn't raise his voice much when we were younger. He didn't, you know, but, but I had broken their hearts by lying to them because they did find, because I would have parties and they would find out about one and then I would be grounded and then, you know, and then I would promise not to do it again which meant I wasn't going to do it again until the next time they caught me, you know what I mean? So this went on and on and on. Um, but so I got, out of, I got out of high school, and I was, um, I was at Carolina, and I was, and I was oh, also then um, when I graduated high school, I was given a, a trip to France um, on my own. And... Like I said, I'm an old woman. We could smoke on the planes back then. And I was in the front of the plane, and my parents had gotten me, no, my parents got me a ticket of non-smoking, but I was going to go back and go smoking. I was 17 at the time. And um, so I'm in the back of the plane, and I start talking to this woman, and she, uh, you know, we all start talking, and, and before I know it, this gentleman, uh, this Turkish gentleman is giving me scotch out of his bottle, and we're all drinking. And I kind of remember feeling like really weird. And I remember one woman going down. And uh, next thing I remember, I do remember like Jewel of the Nile being on TV, and then on uh, the uh, the movie. And the next thing I remember, I'm being wheeled around the. Um, I, don't, I think it was Charles de Gaulle Airport, I'm not sure if it was or Orly, in a wheelchair with throw up all over me. And what had happened was the plane went from New York to Paris on to Istanbul. And uh, it was the guy, the plane broke down and everybody had to leave the plane and I was shoved up underneath the seats with all my baggage on top of me and they had stolen my passport and my ticket and everything. 
And apparently what they do is they, they take young ladies and they take them on to Istanbul and they really aren't seen again. Um, but the plane broke down and it was the guy vacuum cleaning out the plane who found me and wheeled me around the Paris in, airport illegally because I had no papers until I could find my family. And my aunt came and picked me up. And you know, I, I, that stuff didn't register to me. Like I could have, I had been drugged. Uh, they did a drug thing, I had enough to kill me. I didn't die from that. I could have been living uh, or existing in a life that would have been worse than death. That didn't affect me. <laughs> Once, and I went into like for 26 hours I slept or I don't know, mini coma, whatever, you know, I was out of it. And then once I came to, the first thing I wanted to do was go down. I had been on the plane with uh, the bandmates of uh, Kid Creole and the Coconuts. And they had, in my book, they had put their address. And so I was telling my family, I want to go to Dijon and find these guys and ask them what happened to me. When really all I wanted to do was go party. Like as soon as I came to, my first inclination was to get back in there and start partying again. And, uh, you know, I didn't realize at the time that was alcoholic behavior. You know, it took me a little bit of sobriety to realize that that's not normal. Um, but I, uh, and, you know, my parents just were, they were devastated. They, they were like, you know, what happened? But it, as long as I was up again, I was good to go. So, uh, like I said, then I was at Carolina, and I kept quitting classes and working in the restaurant business. I loved it. At 18, I started working at a restaurant in uh, Chapel Hill. I don't know if y'all are from. It's called Spanky's. It's like a bar, and I thought I had made it. Like, all the popular people worked there, and I was like, this is it. So, that was the life for me. So, I kept quitting and whatnot. And so, my parents... Uh, <clears throat> And I drank heavily, and I drank and partied heavily in the restaurant business. And so my parents are, are both academics, and they were like, if you're going to do that, you're going to, um, you're, you're going to go to school. So I got sent off to school in France for three years, which was really good. I got a hotel restaurant management degree and a culinary degree. Um, and actually, at that time, I was not drinking. Um, I feel looking, well, one, I was worried about weight. I was like 30 pounds lighter than I am now and I was like, oh, you know, because they're very thin over there. And then, and then two, I was also very comfortable because they, I was the American. They didn't, I didn't have to fit any sort of image that people had of what I should be because I was the only one. I mean, you know, so I could pretty much do whatever I wanted to do and it would be cool because I was the American. So, but it's like I didn't need to get out of myself to be someone else. Um, I came back and I lived in, uh, went off and I had met a guy in a metro and I went in for a week in the Bahamas and I ended up staying six months living off of boats, you know, uh, working for an environmental group. I just kind of did things, you know, without any, any sort of consequences. I, uh, I could get into the drinking, it got, but you know, we've all been there. It got really bad. I put myself in a lot of dangerous situations. I did a lot of drinking. I did a lot of ways to try to stop drinking, you know, and none of it. Um, I was in the restaurant business and I could be, I could stay in 13th grade for the rest of my life. You know, you're out of high school, but you're not quite an adult. And, um, and there were no consequences, but I had gotten nothing really of value in my life, you know. And at one point I was a wine rep, and it was just, you know. But wherever I was, whatever party I was at, whatever I was doing, it was never good enough. There always had to be something out there that had to be better than what I was doing. And uh, so um, when I was 30, I decided I needed to change things, so I moved to Greenville, South Carolina. I'd been living in Atlanta. I moved to Greenville, South Carolina. Um, I ended up marrying 
this guy, you know what, he introduced me to morning drinking and that, my friends, was, you know, awesome. I now could drink all day and not have any regrets because this guy, um, he is 16 years older than me. His, his nickname was Tomato Head because he, <laughs> because he had a huge head and he had so much redness from the drinking. And, you know, he was really, I mean, he was just a jerk to people. But that was the one for me. And, and I honestly believe that that was God working for me because we have two gorgeous girls. No, I'm not still together with Tomato Head, but, <laughs> but I have two beautiful girls because I have a magic oven. But, yeah. and, um, but so, and so this is the guy I thought would never, you know, because I was scared to let people in because if people got close to me, they would see how damaged I was. I was. They would, you know, they would see all the defects and all the things, and they wouldn't want to be there. Well, you know, you're only at tomato head. Who's gonna? Is he gonna judge me? No. But you know, I wasn't quite a prize at that time either. I was, you know. So he had issues with keeping a job mainly working so you know Greenville you can only survive that for a little bit until it catches up with you so we moved back moved from Greenville and we had Sophie at that time and we moved back to to Durham and um, and even though I drank I I'm a pastry chef I I could always keep a job I, I I'm good at what I do so I could always count on that you know in my back pocket um, I then had, uh, we had our second child, and uh, at, when I had Sophie, I could stop drinking for the nine months, and it was not a problem. I mean, it was a spiritual experience, and I had Valerie, and I didn't drink, but I white-knuckled it like anything. I mean, it was the hardest thing not to drink during that pregnancy, because I was just, I was ripe for a drink once, once Valerie was born. And once, you know, she, once I started drinking at that point, the worst drinking I have ever experienced in my life was from that point until um, I got help. Uh, it got really bad. And this is where God really, you know, like I've talked about, he's watched over me in the past, but he really took over because, and I help women in this program, um, who have children because God watched over my children while I wasn't capable. I was, um, I would go to work and I would drink um, and, and, I, and, I, and I moved back with my parents once. Oh yeah, because then my, my, I tried to tell my husband that his drinking was bad and he turned around like, honey, <laughs> you know, and he was out of there and he, he left me and I was left with a two and a half year old and a six month old. And the only tool in my little bag was the bottle because I could not believe what was happening. I had no idea how I was gonna raise these girls. And all I knew was to numb myself out. So by seven o'clock I would get them to bed and I would just black out drink. And in the morning I was waking up and I would have to drink a little, and then I would get sick, and I'd have to drink a little more, and I would just, until I could keep it down. And, you know, being a pastry chef who can't even decorate or write because their hands are shaking so bad, it, it, got, it got really, really bad. Um, and I kept the job, you know, of course, you know, like I fought with the owners, I would fight with my parents, I'd fight with everybody, and it was all their fault. And everybody was pulling away from me, and I couldn't talk to anybody, and I was isolating. And then um, I was seeing a therapist every week because of my husband, obviously, you know, and she would talk to me about drinking, and because I was in constant DTs, my, my blood pressure was high, so I learned that if I drank a little mini bottle a half of an hour before I went to go see her, that my blood pressure would drop 
and then we wouldn't have to talk about the drinking as much. So, and get to my real problems, which would be my boss, my mother, and tomato head. So, you know, it had nothing to do with the drinking. That was just what I was having to do. Um, so, so uh, it, it, got, it got really, really bad um, work was constant battle. And I was working in a 100 degree kitchen, had no air conditioning next to a 500 degree oven. And I don't know if you've been drinking all night and you're feeling that gross and you're in that heat and whatnot. It's not real comfortable. You know, I was more comfortable being eight months pregnant with Valerie than I was during that time. And so I, and you know, I was dehydrated. I was so dehydrated from the alcohol. So I woke up one morning and then I was all set to go to work and I walked out the door and it hit, the heat hit me and I was like, I'm not going, I can't, that's it. They're, they're either going to have to get air conditioning in that restaurant or I quit. And so I quit, they changed the locks, you know, I don't know, it, it, I quit, fired, it's all the same at that point. <laughs> there was no going back to that situation. And, um, and I sat at home, and I didn't, I didn't plan on drinking. I mean, there were times in there where I really was trying to stop drinking. And, um, and I, uh, I grabbed a beer, and my little daughter, Sophie, was three. And she looked at me, and she said, Mommy, can I have a beer? And that was it. That was it. That was when I saw what my drinking was doing. Now, a few months prior to that, I had had a car accident. I said I wasn't drunk, but I was. You know, I mean, in my head I wasn't drunk. But six inches either way, and either I was dead or my daughter was dead, my, my six-month-old baby. That didn't stop me from drinking. You know, it's weird what will stop us. Um, there are things that other people think should stop us, but that Sophie asking me if she could have a beer was God speaking to me through my three-year-old daughter. I'm convinced, and and I uh, and my dad was there, and you know, he had been talked to by uh, people at Duke who said, you know, this is a man who lost his older daughter. And he loved me like no, and he wanted to save me so badly. He would have done anything to save me, but he couldn't. And the people that he worked with just said, you have to let her hit her bottom. And it's not going to be pretty, but you have to let her hit her bottom. And by the time I came in here, I... Uh, I had hit my bottom. I was emotionally, I was insane. And I was, you know, emotionally just, I, it was, and physically, my body was shutting down. But uh, I, they asked me, was I ready for help? And I ended up at Wilmington Treatment Center. Now, I had done everything not to be an AA because I knew y'all were a bunch of religious freaks and I was not going to have any of that. So I had researched other alternatives. I had, you know, I was going to I was going to do something, but it was not going to be religious. And I walk into Wilmington Treatment Center and I am so drunk. And I'm like, eh, you know. And um and my uh the I see the I see this Randy prayer on the the wall, and I'm like, oh really? We're we gonna start with God on the walking in, really? Uh, no. So I like I'm marching out and making a big scene. But they were smart. The intake guy was cute, and so I was like, this might not be so bad. <laughs> yeah. And it was God doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. I never saw the guy again. I don't think. I don't think I probably remember. <laughs> you know, but um. But I ended up going to, to Wilmington, and I woke up the next morning in an AA meeting. And I was like crying. I was crying the whole night before. I was crying the next day. I was crying. But in that meeting, I remember all of a sudden, remember I was saying like everybody was just on my back, and, every, and I was isolating because I just couldn't 
talk to anybody anymore. Nobody could understand. And all of a sudden, these people who I had never met in my life are talking, and they're talking about what's going on in here. And I hadn't felt that in a really long time. I mean, in a, for the la you know, for the longest time, people are telling me how insane I am, and what, and they're telling me my story in all different forms and sizes and whatnot. And I realized, oh my goodness, this is this is you know, and um, and I loved rehab. I mean, I. I joked about it early in recovery and said I would have started drinking again if I could go back to rehab because it was uh, like I had 28 days where my parents were watching my kids and all I could, I got to concentrate on what was going on. I mean, they explained to me that I had a lot of anger inside of me and I had a lot of resentments and all this stuff. I was like, what are you talking about? You know, I thought I was Mother Teresa and they were like, no. <laughs> but they got, but I got in there and I got, I got insight on how to take care of things. And, you know, and I got my feet wet in AA and, um, you know, I had, we had process groups, and I loved them. And during one of the process groups, I kind of went, like, overboard, and I started fist-stepping everybody in the process group. Stuff I would... I've been lying to my therapist for years, paying her $100 an hour, and now all of a sudden I'm, like, letting go. And it was... Uh, it was very, really, it was very scary because all of a sudden I realized what I had done. And then, but I remember there was this guy in there, and he was like, you know, he is a Rico Suave of the the every every they yeah every rehab has the Rico Suave who's like you. Know, but God again talking through this guy who I had trusted nothing this man said, but all of a sudden he says to me. You know, I, I grew up the same religion as you. I know the God that you grew up with. And he goes, but I tell you what, he goes, if you need to, you can borrow my God because my God loves you exactly how you are, you know. And, and once I settled down from having let all this stuff out, I felt like, oh, my God, you know. I didn't die. Like, I let people know inner truths about me, and I didn't die. I am okay, you know? And I all of a sudden felt like I wasn't going through this alone. And I felt like there, I did have a God with me. Um, I got back to, to Durham, and I, uh, I, um, were, Durham Chapel Hill, whatever, and I joined a, a home group right away. Uh, the Tar Heel group, because I am a Tar Heel, and so I was like, that's got to be the place for me. And, you know, I got a sponsor, and um, and I was doing well. I mean, I was loving life. I was that kind of new, sober person who had no filter. I would go out in the streets and tell everybody how great sobriety was and that I was in AA, you know, and they were like, okay, you know, crazy, that's great. When you're at job interviews doing that, they are kind of like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but, you know, so, um, and it was great. You know, I was unemployed for six, and I had never been unemployed. Like, I'm always very, like, I'm always working. My, I think that's one of the... Uh, my dad's a workaholic, and I, tra I got some of those traits. Like, you know, I had never not been a pastry chef or whatever, you know, like, and so that was part of my identity, and so now I'm unemployed. But that six months of unemployment, and I literally was trying to get anything at that time, but it, it gave me the time. I think it was God just giving me that time to focus on my sobriety and put myself into it because then... Then I got a job in Raleigh, and I had and um, and I loved it. It was at a great restaurant in Raleigh. And luckily, I had the the you know underneath me what it takes to deal in the restaurant business. You know, I was having to drive back from Raleigh. Uh, on I-40 and tried to get back to daycare because after six o'clock they charge a dollar per hour per minute you know trying to balance everything and I had the best daycare they were so wonderful and helped me to raise those girls and I had the I, I had these wonderful people in AA who you know I just had to follow what they were doing you know and um, 
and they help me raise. Like I said, my my girls are uh, two and a half. They were two and a half and six months. So they're three and one when I started in AA. Now they're fourteen and sixteen, and they're taller than I am. Uh, and by the way, my sobriety date is well. we'll Sorry, I should have said it at the beginning. I'll say it in a second. So anyway, we uh, working at this restaurant, loved it. Um, the guy, the boss, I knew him for a long time, um, and he uh, he says, Stephanie, um, it, it, we we're doing a wine dinner, and I had to make a dessert that went with the wine. He goes, here, try this, and I said, no, you know, no, thanks. And he he knew very well that I was sober. And he said it, and I was like, no, no. And so then he comes back to my station, and he's like, here, Steph, try this. Just don't go crazy. And, and I did, and I took a sip. I mean, I gave the rest of it away, but I did take a sip. And so um, I did pick up a white chip for that. So my sobriety date is November 20th, 2004. Um, you know, people are like, oh, for a sip. and da, da, da. But at that point, I made that man my higher power. You know, I don't need to, all I have is today, honestly, in sobriety, and I don't need to know, you know, none of that time before that was wasted. It's just, I know that if I didn't do that and get honest with myself, um, I I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be here today. It wasn't that, it, I picked, so when I all of a sudden blurted out what I had done to the Tar Heel group, and then they had all their rules and stuff. They were like, somebody like pulled me on a woman, pulled me aside outside, like you're gonna have to pick up a white chip. And I'm very okay with it now. At that time, I was not okay with it. And there was a lot of yelling at God and at people <laughs> in the car ride home and stuff. But that was a Wednesday and I knew I was gonna go to any length. I knew I was gonna do what they said for me to do. I just was upset about it. But that was a Wednesday, and I did pick up on Saturday, November 20th. So that's a Wednesday to a Saturday. You got a window there. And back at the house, I have a bottle of 82 Lafitte just sitting there, which I meant to drink before I got sober. You know? And so I'm like, I'm going to be picking up the white chip. You know? Shouldn't we make it worth it? You know? But the thing is, that change had occurred in me. That change, that change had occurred because I did not know for certain I had a recovery left in me. I mean, it took everything I had. When people say that that uh, that drunk people, that's just a lack of willpower. It took so much willpower to live that life that I was living, and I could not go back to that. And I wasn't sure that once I got started. I would be able to turn off the faucet, pick up a white chip, and go on with life. I just wasn't. So I sold the bottle of wine, picked up the white chip, and then really got like into AA. Not just coming, not just enjoying it, not riding the pink cloud, but really got into AA. And I worked the steps hard with a sponsor, and she she held me accountable. You know, she did stuff, whatever. What was important was what what I was doing, and and so for uh, for the third step, we had to work on that one a lot. I had a lot of you know I would call her with all my problems, like I had all these problems, and she would say, "Did you pray about it?" And I was like, "What are you talking about? I'm telling you my problems." And she was like, "Did you pray about it?" Like, no. And she'd be like, "Okay, call me when you have." And this would go on and on. And so then one morning, uh, you know. And then she would ask me, did you pray about it? And I'd be like, yes. And she's like, Stephanie, call me when you have. And you know, she did. So, so then I would start like, okay, fine. I'm going to go ahead and pray about it. And then I'll call her. And when I started doing those actions, which in the beginning, I had hoped that they would work. But I really was like, this does not seem like the solution for everything going on in my life. I had hope. I did have hope. But the more I did it, I realized that, and I lived life day, you know, one day at a time, and I did the next right thing, and I did, I learned that my life was getting easier. You know, my daughter was like, Mommy, you haven't cried, you know, since you came back from from the hospital, you know, from, from rehab, basically. And I was there, I was present for my kids, and things were, were clearing up, and it was... 
you know, I was doing what I was being told to do. I didn't always believe about it in it in the beginning, but that wasn't my decision to make. I just had to do what I was told to do and follow those in front of me. You know, I, I stayed on the fourth step for a while and I was writing and writing and, and my sponsor was like, oh my God, stop being a martyr. Just get it done and get it to me, you know? And then we, uh, we got it done and then the fifth step, you know, the fifth step was amazing. And, you know, and I was able to tell her, you know, what I had told the others, which we never saw again, plus all the stuff. And she, she loved me just the way I was, and that was amazing. And she said, you know, Stephanie, how do you feel about intimacy? And I was like, well, I'm not dating because, like, you know, like it, it literally it took me three and a half years to even go out for coffee with somebody because I was so scared of going back out. Like, and so I was like, well, I'm not into intimacy right now because, and she goes, Stephanie, that's not what I'm talking about. She goes, intimacy is what we have right here. Intimacy is you letting me in and it being okay. Like, we're, you're allowed to be intimate, you know, vertically, you know, and, and be okay with it. <laughs> and be okay with it, you know, and um, that was, that was something new, because, you know, when I was drinking, there was so much lying, and so much being someone else, and this, you know, God, I would party with these people, and party with those people, but these people didn't know those people, and the worst thing was when the people all got together, and you were like, oh my God, it's going to explode, because all those different personalities that I had, and now I could just be me, and that was a relief, you know, and I, um, I, <coughs> You know, I did, I made my amends, a lot of my amends also had to be living amends, you know, and and the promises started coming true, and what my life looks like today, you know, I don't, and I don't do things perfectly, and I have to, I have to watch because I can't just sit there and give myself a break, on the, you know, but I can't beat myself up either because I'll have a tendency of thinking I'm the worst of the worst and just get really down about things when it really, you know, I just need to fix some things, you know. Um, but there's so much in my life which is just, it's just so much peaceful, more peaceful now. Um, I have I have a job which I love. I'm a pastry chef at the finest university around, uh, UNC Chapel Hill. <laughs> uh, I come from an all Duke family. You know, my sponsors aren't Duke. I, I take a lot of, a lot of crap. Um, but I love what I do. I love what I do. Um, I love every year when the kids come in and they look like they've won the lottery, you know. But my program follows me into everything that I do. Um, I, have, I have people working for me all over the campus. And um, I'm, you know, I was an alcoholic and in the restaurant business. I didn't really have the communication skills to lead others. And now I can be that person for them. Um, I am raising those two girls. Uh, they are the light of my life. They're also going to be the bane of my existence. But, you know, <laughs> I, can, I can help other women in this program and lead them through because that shame of being a mother that drinks, it, for me, was just haunting and it was crushing. And I can walk them through that and help them to take that pain and to help somebody else with it, you know. The walking these ladies through it and, and listening to their fourth and fifth steps and watching their light be turned on in them is amazing. You know, having, having the life given to other people is just incredible. Like when I was at the International, you know, a couple of years ago, and when all those people are there, and I thought how much pain it took me to even get through the front door that story times 60,000, it's amazing to me, the stories that were in that building. 
And that's why this program will just always astonish me. And I want to make sure that I do whatever it takes to make sure that it is here for, for those still sick and suffering. Um, you know, I'm, my problems today are um, mostly of my perception. You know, I like how I view the world should be or this should be or that should be. I have to accept that God is everything or he's nothing at all. Like the, the world, everything is the way it is supposed to be. I may not agree with it or not agree with it, but you know, I can, I, like I, all I can do is work my program in it and, and make it a better place than, than I found, you know. You know, this week I had a Valentine's Day. I had a miracle happen. Um, it was Valentine's Day. I had events going on in both locations. Lenore Rams had two huge events. Um, my dad calls me. Your mom's not getting up. My mom has Parkinson's and uh, Louis body Parkinson's and dementia. My dad has a lot of issues. Uh, my mom and I had a very, very volatile relationship for a very long time. You know, but I had worked hard in this program to, to make that, you know, living amends. I bring, her, I bring her flowers every week. No matter what's going on, I bring her flowers, and I've worked really, really hard on working on that relationship. Um, she had what appears to be a mild stroke, and, and uh, it was really scary. You know, she was, my dad's like looking at her, and she's not breathing all the time. You go, see that? That's brain damage. And, and it was really hard on me. I mean, I, I broke and, you know, I was crying. But I felt if that was the last time that she would recognize me, I was okay with it because I, everything had been said. You know what I'm saying? I didn't, I didn't, there was a time not so long ago where it came to the point we were fighting so much and, and someone said to me, you know, you have three choices in life. It's like you can either accept it, you can change it, or you can move on. And I knew that that's my mom. I couldn't move away from that, you know. And and today I have a loving relationship, you know. In fact, you know, Beth was, was touching on how, you know, we're friends now. And there was a time, not always the bigger, I'm not always the bigger person. There were issues that I had, you know, with, with, with our situation. And I prayed to God every day. To love that woman like I love myself, or love, you know. And today I have the benefit of knowing Beth and loving her. She is such a special woman, and, and I and I'm, I watch her strength when when things are tough, and and just her kindness. And and these are the gifts of the program that you know God gets to speak through us and to connect to others um, where we alone would not be able to. And so, anyway, with that, um, I'll say thank you. <laughs>